Boston? Yeah. Uh, Were you born in Boston? No, I was not born in Boston. So I was born in Western Massachusetts, and I was delivered by an Amish midwife oh. in my uh, mom's parents' house. That's great. And then I only lived there for nine months, so obviously I don't remember much of that. <laughs> then moved to North Shore, Essex. Uh, mm-hmm. Lived there through middle school. Moved up to New Hampshire for high school. Military. Then back to Boston for college. And the rest of my kind of young 20s upbringing. Are you like sold on California now? Oh, or do you think you'll ever go back? Um, when I'm rich and famous, I'll go get like a summer house there. Mm-hmm. Or a winter house, because I also like skiing. What do you love about California? Because that's a, that's a very like New England upbringing. Very much so. I like California just because I have the ability to do anything whenever I want. Mm. I don't have the restrictions, even though... From a weather standpoint. Yes. Okay. And it's also cheaper than Boston, which everyone complains about San Diego being so expensive. I'm saving money living out here. <laughs> Boston is the top three most expensive cities in the country, I think. Really? Yeah. Goes, Are we the number three? No, San Francisco, New York, and Boston. Not including Honolulu, because that's just ridiculous. <laughs> that's they, an outlier. They, they're an outlier. They're continental 48. <laughs> Yeah. So Boston's number two? Number uh, three. It's either two or three. Okay. Because I think I San Francisco's maybe. first, and then it might be either New York or Boston. But we were almost moved to New York as well, because I was supposed to open up the Polynesian, which is a uh, tiki bar. And, oh. Uh, I always forget his name. But that didn't work out, so I stayed in Boston for another year and mm-hmm. worked for Pernod. Mm-hmm. Then from there, I went to California. Hey, hey, hey. Drove cross country with my two dogs, towing my car. Never towed a car ever in my life. Never drove a tra- had a trailer on the back of my car and did it first time driving cross country. Oh, my gosh. With I was driving the big old U-Hauls with just the front wheel jack um, car thing. Did you do, did you take like a full five days? Or did you I, like... My goal is to do it in three days, <laughs> but uh, I was driving with someone who didn't like to drive as much as I did. Uh-huh. And we also had to drive separate vehicles, uh-huh. so there's no trading off. I could drive for like 10 hours a day with a couple breaks, easy. But So Not, I ended up taking yeah. closer to six days. And we left mm-hmm. on the 5th, and we landed on the 12th. I've never done oh, the full days. cross-country drive. And we did the longer route. We didn't do direct. We went above, like through Ohio area, and then went down to Denver to meet up with a friend, and then shot down from Denver. It's only a couple hundred more miles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it was fun. We survived a flash flood in Nebraska where Whoa. we got the police knock on our apartment door at like six, or our hotel door at like six o'clock in the morning. And we got out and the water is right at the base of the cab of the truck. So luckily it started. Her, my, the person I was driving with, her car was around the corner and luckily that started. And because I got stuck driving through that night and had to offload my car, my little car that's really low to the ground happened to be in a dry spot. Oh my goodness. So I had to wade back in waist high water all the way through back to get my car, drive it across a sidewalk and a median between some restaurants to then go meet up and then drive out again. Oh my goodness. Make for the high ground. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's the most intense uh, thunderstorms I've ever been in. Like I was on the highway and like out there in Nebraska, you go like 80. I was down to 35 miles an hour with the windshield wipers fully going, pulling into our hotel and just like passing out and waking up to all that debacle. Oh my goodness. You know, I have this like, it's like a remembered dream where I was driving along, I think it was through Nebraska, and I looked out my window and I saw a huge tornado. And there's a part of me that thinks that this happened to me in real life. Hmm. And there's a part of me that just knows that it's just the, the scene from Twister. Oh yeah, that I have burned in my in my brain. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I seen Twister. Maybe I've also never seen a tornado thing. in real life, though. I don't think I have either. But we're not sure. This might have been a fever sure. dream from some random time you ran away been. to Nebraska and don't remember. Yeah, well, I lived in Denver for a little bit, and so we would sometimes like take little drive trips, we'd just drive to go nowhere. Well, that's hey, Daniel, thanks for your feedback. That's um, everything up in the Midwest. He said the audio is great today. Thanks for those of you who have popped in a little early. We decided to start a little bit early so that we could just make sure that the audio is real dialed in. Um, but I don't think any of us are in focus right now. So that's... (laughs) (laughs) 
Very helpful, right? <laughs> Make sure I lean far back and far We are going to get started in just like a minute and 30 seconds officially at 4.30. But for those of you who have dropped in early, drop a line in the chat. Let us know who's here. We know Daniel's here. He's ready to make an improved whiskey cocktail. Uh, who else is around? And where are you calling in from? What's the weather like? It's like 85 degrees in San Diego ah, today. It's so nice. And I said, why isn't this a Saturday? <laughs> we actually went to the beach on Sunday. It was really nice. We went on Monday. Um, and it, it was the kind of thing where it's like, are we really going to go to the beach on Saturday uh, when it's 75 degrees out in San Diego in March at the beginning of spring break? Was it as bad as you expected? Uh, there were a million people there. <laughs> Well, there's a place you have to go check out called Santa Cruz Cliffs mm. in OB, and it's like the local hangout. Oh, it's the local spot, you guys. You have to go local down this like, set of big set of stairs all the way down in, and then it splits into two parts, and they're kind of coved in on all rocks. So all even right. when it's like a little bit colder of a day, you get all the way down there, and there's no wind. And you have this whole backdrop where you can just hang out, and no one knows about it. All right, once we can start doing cocktail tourism again... We're going to do like exclusive tiki cocktails at the beach in San Diego, now that we know all the local spots. <clears throat> so um, we're enjoying very warm weather in San Diego. Um, Tom, it's snowing in Maryland <laughs> suddenly. Oh, goodness. Um, I think the improved whiskey cocktail is a wonderful drink to have. I usually think about it in terms of cold weather and so that's kind of why it's a march cocktail but then we have these weird like really toasty snaps in san diego so that's why um, we live here in san diego <clears throat> it's part of the benefits of being here thanks for coming in y'all it's 4 30 we're gonna get started on the improved whiskey cocktail live stream thank you for all of your feedback on the audio terrence it's raining in Massachusetts. In Lowell. My buddy lives in Lowell. Ah, we have a, a, a new guest here today with us. Uh, this is Xander, Xander Brown. We were talking before we went um, live at 4.30 about his New England background. Yes. Uh, so he's been in San Diego just for, what, almost two years? Two years two in years? July. In July. Okay, so two years is, you know, it's like my daughter saying she's almost five when she's four and a quarter, but... Same, same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already a San Diego. I can say that, right? That's right. Uh, we have Diane Ohio from Ohio. Good to see you again, Diane and Virgin and John Park. We've got some regulars back on. Robert, Portland, Maine. All over the country here today. Um, as you come in, just let us know who you are and where you're from. It's always nice for us because we can't see you to get an idea of who's on the other side and uh, get your, your whiskey out. Break on through. We're, yeah, break on through. Let us know. This is Come the only over. way. Come hang out. <laughs> Where are you at? Uh, so Stefan is doing Stefan things um, for his brand this week, and we're happy to have Xander here. Xander is, um, as we said, almost two years in San Diego. Grew up. In... Most interesting fact about me. We're just going to yeah. keep repeating that the entire time. <laughs> Comes from New England. Um, and he is currently working with Uncle Nearest, which is a beautiful whiskey brand that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, with a really amazing story, origin story and current modern story. Yes. Uh, and we got Sean on camera too. I'm here. Which is lovely. I'm not sure why. He's usually, you know, working behind the camera, but I always love it when he can join us up on screen too, so. Well, also it's the improved whiskey cocktail, so. I, honestly, last week I was behind the camera for the daiquiri. And I didn't let the cocktail stay on. We had to pass one to him. <laughs> he also just really wanted to match with me. We impromptu we decided true. to wear tiki, so he wanted to kind of match with me. Tiki for our improvement. We both got the short sleeve battle memo. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. Yeah. It's also generally my wardrobe <clears throat> all the time, so I'll drink anything wearing any tiki. There we go. Uh, the Improved Whiskey Cocktail is a really special cocktail. I think especially from... <clears throat> Sean and I, when we first started making cocktails, we had the three bottle bar, <laughs> which was an expansion from our one bottle bar, one bottle being whiskey. And the very first thing other than old fashions was the improved whiskey cocktail. And so we went out and we 
we finally splurged on our really small budget to get some maraschino liqueur and some absinthe. Oh no, come on. Look, when you, when you first just start out buying bottles for making cocktails and you buy absinthe, I feel like you graduate a little bit. Come on. I mean, it was like a $70 so, bottle. Yeah, gold star. Appreciate That's the kind of whiskey. thing, you know. Yeah. We come, we come from family backgrounds where they're like, I don't want to pay $10 for a cocktail. Right. Like, they won't, just won't drink out, ever. <laughs> um, and so, anyway, that's our history. That's kind of what has, it was a big milestone on our journey, and we're excited to share this together with you. So, <clears throat> we're going to get started with making the first cocktail so everyone can have one in their hands. Xander, before we do that, yes. I gave you a little mini introduction. Would you like to say anything to our guests? Uh, hello, thank you for having me here. Um, obviously, she talked a little bit about my background with my current brand that I work for, but I kind of fell into the spirits world by accident. Um, I was, I think at the time, a bike messenger, and I realized that I'm not going to make any money, and I like to pay my bills and feed myself. And I was a regular at a bar in Boston called Drink. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. If you are and live near the area, please go there, tell everyone Xander says hi. Um, my sister actually used to work there, and I just we used to be a regular and just go in there and harass and harass because they had such amazing, simple, beautiful cocktails with fresh made juice, fresh made syrups. And I reached out to Ezra Starr at the time, and I was like, can I get a job? And she said yes. And I had never worked at a bar, never served, never done anything. And after about three years, I was able to be a bartender there, and that kind of set me down the path of history and booze. So that's what kind of brings us here and kind of talking about some fancy cool cocktails. Nice. You traded bikes for booze. Bikes for booze, you which still... is better not to mix. So I decided to do one. <laughs> this is true. You still get a DUI on a bicycle. <laughs> that's right. That's true. It is. And some pretty gnarly injuries, but we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, I won't true. talk about any of my scars. Okay. <clears throat> so for the improved whiskey cocktail, you want um, a nice, we're going to use rye. Right? Mm. Is it just traditional and unapproved whiskey cocktail mm. to use rye over bourbon? If you're out of the rye, you can use bourbon. Oh, okay. are we going to use bourbon? Did we decide? We got on... the bourbon. Oh, yeah, I think we're doing written house. That's what we decided. We're going to do written house. Um, we I grabbed the, bottle, the wrong bottle. Um, but you could also use bourbon. The difference with rye is just like this nice, like punchier, spicier whiskey. And so we like to use it in some whiskey forward drinks. Um, and then the other thing is. Um, we, and we didn't do it today, unless we have one. No, we'll use this one. Sometimes we like to chill our mixing glass beforehand. No, we did. We did? Yeah. Well, if you want to use this one, though, Xander, you can. You want to use that one? This one's beautiful. beautiful. It's We're going to put it in a uh, chilled drink already, so we don't need to get too complicated the, here. When we made, if you joined us for the Sazerac a couple of weeks ago, we definitely made sure to emphasize chilling your mixing glass, because the Sazerac is not served over ice, and so you want to get that really, really, really cold. Um, the improved whiskey cocktail can be served over a large ice rock, which I think is what we're going to do today. Correct. And so, uh, yeah, if you didn't freeze your mixing glass, don't worry. That's just one of those nice you. little things to do. All right, I'm going to let Xander take it away. I'm going to drop the recipe in the chat. Can you talk about the two different recipes that we are Definitely. offering so, to, to folks for their options? We had the recipe that's already been introduced to you guys. I just have a slight variation from basically where I was trained. The main difference is the amount of hard alcohol, a little bit of uh, maraschino, and also kind of technique and bitter choice. The cocktail that's in there that you guys already saw is a quarter simple syrup, an eighth of maraschino, and then you rinse the absinthe, one, uh, two dash ango, and then two ounces rye. I'm gonna do a little bit of variation on that because in Boston, we base all our old fashions off three ounces, so. We are hardier folk who need more alcohol to survive the cold. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start mine with just a simple quarter ounce of simple syrup. Um, I think we're using rinse simple syrup today. Yes. Yes. I'm. I'm really. I promise you guys. I'm trying to drop this in the chat. And then I'm also going to do quarter maraschino. So I promise I am actually doing the right measurements, even though you can't see. So if you like a boozier cocktail, use mine. Or is a Xander sized cocktail, right? <laughs> Xander sized or if you're a true New Englander, <laughs> either one. All right. I don't know why I can't open this chat. I'm working on it. 
Um, if you are really impatient, you can also pull up the recipe at thecocktailjourney.com. Click on cocktail recipe or cocktails, and you'll see the one that we've published. Also, a nice little technique as you're building a cocktail, start out with the cheapest possible items. So if you make a mistake, you're not throwing away a lot of booze. Then from here, so I did, as I said, quarter simple, quarter maraschino, then two and a half, um, our, our, sorry, our Rittenhouse. Then I'm gonna do a bar spoon of absinthe. There's lots of choices out there, so go with whatever you like, Pernod, or whatever you can afford, whatever's cheapest. And then, thank you, sir. Oh, I'll go with <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'll give that back to you. Um, so a lot of people like to crack their ice as well. I think a lot of it is depending on kind of how your end presentation goes or what you're going into. We're going to be pouring over a chilled glass and a nice beautiful cube. So having why you're cracking ice is to give more surface area. I feel like that's unnecessary because you're already serving it on ice in a chilled glass, so you don't need that extra dilution. Uh, and also, you can stir fancy like me where you keep the back of the spoon on the edge of the glass, but honestly, if you don't want to mess with that, just turn it over and spin it, whatever makes it easier for you. This is just for nice, quiet, fancy bars where you don't have to hear all the clanging, but at home, no one cares. It's for you. It's actually a really great tip. Um, I think that... I probably shouldn't say this because I actually am a barware maker and designer. <laughs> and we make barware that is worthy of a beautiful ritual. But honestly, if you don't have a bar spoon, you can also just use a chopstick or something yeah. that like, I mean, this is not the elevated cocktail experience, but if you want to talk about stirring a cocktail and not jostling it and trying to achieve that like really smooth finish, then you're not going to use, you're not going to, you don't stir a cocktail the way you stir like iced tea, jostling all the ice around. Um, and so if you use a, either a stir or a chopstick, it basically achieves the same thing. A little less on the presentation side, but it'll work in a bit. Yeah. I'll get very simplistic. Um, also, any observant uh, members noticed I did not add any bitters, so I'm going to sneak that in because no one's going to notice afterwards or before. Oh, you, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about what happens if you leave out an ingredient. You just add it when no one's watching. <laughs> not when you're live and everyone yeah. can see you. <laughs> do as we say. Not as we do. Not as we do. Um, it's so funny. I actually just... So we're in the middle of recording some bartending... Sort of like a bartending 101, a bartending basics series. And I just recorded that yesterday, right? What happens if you leave out an ingredient when you're making a cocktail? We are talking about in the context of shaking. Just open that shaker, add yeah. it in, give it another quick shake. Or in Xander's case, give it a quick stir. Exactly. And generally, depending on the ingredients, especially bitters itself, are not going to impact it as much. If you, for example, have a shaking cocktail and you forget the citrus and you want to add it afterwards... You're going to change the whole texture of the cocktail. Mm -hmm. With this, I can get away with that. No one's going to be shocked or scared about not putting that in. Again, we're talking about simple presentation. I kind of fall underneath specifically cocktails like this where you don't need to add much. It's already a delicious cocktail. Simple, beautiful. I don't like to chew on peels that go in it. A lot of people do an expressed orange on top or lemon, but I think that's what the bitters kind of represent with this because I want the absence to shine through. Um... Variations on why we rinse or put it in. Uh, generally, with rinsing, you're going to have a little less absinthe in the total quantity. Um, I like a little bit more of the absinthe flavor, the wormwood, the bitterness. And even if you want less, you can use an atomizer. Simple little beautiful thing. And if you want more, you can also atomize after as well. So, you're an, so if you're an absinthe fan, a really nice finish or like mm -hmm. what could replace your garnish is just a nice little spritz, a finishing spritz. Um, we had a question about uh, if you don't have rich simple syrup and you only had simple syrup, would you add a little bit more? Would you make that meniscus go a little higher? Just a, a bit higher. Um, you don't have to worry about it too much. Rich is like, it's, yeah, I say just add a hair more. Add a little bit. And more. also, the big, big thing is just you also can just add the same amount, taste it, and then add it more. 
figure mm -hmm. out what works for you. Because every little recipe is going to change a little bit different. Even if you heat your simple syrup versus not heating your simple syrup, changes the molecular compound on whether the, the viscosity of I don't want to get too crazy into science. Oh, and stuff like we that. can talk about that. That's interesting. But uh, it does heating and heating a simple syrup and cooling a simple syrup does change the sweetness a touch. So just figure out what works for you guys. Use whatever sugar works for you guys. I even love messing around with this and doing a demerara simple syrup. So a non molasses yes. brown sugar mm -hmm. adds a lot more depth and richness. Mm -hmm. It can kind of totally change a cocktail. So it's that's a fun thing to do is just change one recipe of this, like kind of what we're going to go into a little bit later is changing out one product to make something different. Like instead of maraschino, you could do like a dry curacao, mm -hmm. kind of what the history, you want to go a little bit in history now? Or? Yeah, let's talk about, um, so while Xander's talking a little bit about the history of the improved whiskey cocktail, and as you all are finishing making, or if you're quick at it, drinking your drinks. Oh, sorry. I took it. Um, Willy nilly on my own. Let me know. Uh, drop in the chat any questions you have about this like this preparation that we just that we just did if you have any questions along the lines of what happens if I have different simple syrup around or um, as you taste the cocktail if something's not sitting right with you and you're like how would I correct this for the second version of the cocktail ask that question in the chat and we'll get to that Perfect. Um, tell us about which we, we shared our history of the improved whiskey cocktail what is the history uh, the history of the cocktail kind of goes back to when cocktails were way more simple. Like 1805, there is the, the basic cocktail. It's just bitter, sugar, water, and spirit. And you kind of reference there, he's, an interesting thing is they don't even mention ice, because ice was not an original ingredient of cocktails. So from there, it was very simple. Like, we just had the alcohol. And even on top of that is that alcohol in general was not had the same quality control it has nowadays. So it's just very kind of get, have a good time, drink some uh, booze, and hopefully you don't die from some random disease. One of the things that really blows me away about the, the effect that Prohibition had on cocktails is that because the manufacturers stopped making all the alcohol, then people started making their own, and Correct. it tasted terrible. And that's so why we added so many things. Yeah, a lot of cocktails really kind of came about because they had to try and cover up the taste of the alcohol. So this is kind of almost the opposite, though, because so what happened is they started adding all these improvements to the original cocktails. They added some modifiers, some dry curacao, some maraschino, some absinthe. It was the new style of cocktails or improved cocktails. Mm -hmm. But people started to not really like it. It was only uh, Jerry Thomas made his second edition of his book in 1876 with a whole addendum of improved cocktails. But out of the many cocktails, cocktail books that were made during that time is only a mention in a handful. So obviously people would go mm. and make an improved cocktail and people would say, no, I want it the old fashioned way. Ah. So that's how we get the original old fashioned. It's the old fashioned style before the improved. You think about that. Yeah. You would never yeah. name something old fashioned until there's actually a, a new version one. of it. Yeah. And Correct. then you call it the old or the original version. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the cool thing is I think, and then from there is that, um, it did kind of fall out of style. And then obviously we go into prohibition where then the booze is just so bad, so much bad, so much bad, so, so much, much bad. Worse. That's a technical term. Look it up. So much bad booze. <laughs> I am a professional and I talk in front of people all the time. Uh, we add like, that's why we get the old fashioned from the Wisconsin style with the cherries and the oranges and the sugar and the soda. And it's an old fashioned. They decided but, to improve it in a different way. Correct. And I don't, I will never yuck anyone's yums as my old, uh, absolute <laughs> elix brand ambassador told me, I like that. Uh -huh. um, drink what makes you happy. But many people here, here. want different things that make other things hit them happy. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> that's great. So it originally, we put stuff in booze to make it taste better. Just and, simple sugar, bitters, water. And then we're like, this is kind of boring. Let's make it even fancier. Mm -hmm. So we could add, going back to their couple bottles that they have for their, like something simple like a dry curacao or an orange liqueur. The absinthe that we were talking about before, right here, or even maraschino. It's like mm -hmm. just simple modifiers that add a complexity, add a different flavor to the whiskey that you already normally drink and enjoy. And we've talked about this concept already um, in these live streams. I think that one of, I don't even remember which cocktail it is. I feel like we've done enough by now. 
Um, but we were talking about how would you make this cocktail different? And Stefan made a suggestion, just like add a bar spoon of Amari or, or mm -hmm. something else. It's a ver it's a way to improve or make different the experience of a really simple cocktail. Um, we used to call it the technique of the Mr. Potato Head, uh -huh. where you basically exchange an eye for a different eye, where you can take a traditional gin cocktail, uh, or kind of what we were referencing is, um, I'm trying to tie this into another note I wrote down, mm -hmm. is a white lady was improved by brandy, but you don't call it the improved white lady cocktail, it's actually just a sidecar. Mm. So, but this, it's a very good technique to have for home bartenders. If you like a cocktail flavor profile with a specific spirit, change it out with a different spirit to try a, a different new cocktail. Mm -hmm. And so, so on that yeah. note, if you, for whatever reason, are not a whiskey fan, mm -hmm. you could also make an improved gin cocktail. Just swap out the whiskey for the gin. Exactly. Right? And or you just... if you like tequila better. Generally, mm -hmm. a lot of these plug and play very well together. Mm -hmm. They're all balanced for that. There's only certain spirits that might be mm -hmm. aggravated like if you go really high octane something like a 151 you're not going to make a old fashioned with that unless mm -mm. you've had a very hard week mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or use a lot of water a lot of water um one of the things that i began to improve my gin cocktails with was absinthe and i was like wow gin and absinthe go really well together i would like savory cocktails i really mm -hmm. like and so that's why the gibson is my one of my favorites um and then I think I started, I don't know, we were just doing easy cocktails and we'd do like a gin old fashioned and we'd be like, let's put a little absinthe in that. I personally like absinthe. Um, I'm curious though, because usually out of a group of a dozen people, there are one or two people who just do not do absinthe. Yeah, like the cilantro response. No. My mom, my mom has a cilantro. She hates hate cilantro. Yeah, um, my, my brother-in-law cannot do it. Yes. Can't do it. Um, and so if you're one of those people... Um, I, I'd be curious to know if we have anyone in the audience today who is like a no absinthe or if you just avoided this whole live stream because of that fact. You don't like the green fairy? <laughs> you know, part of, part if of you... our journey too, I think just to go back to like the, the morphing, the, the morphology, if you will, of like mm -hmm. your cocktail journey per se, I really started to kind of appreciate the spine or the core or the classics of cocktails more and more the more i played because it's almost like you don't really know what you're tasting until you mess it up oh of like, course oh this tastes really bad why <laughs> is that like let's try and make that never happen again you know um that like the tragedy that is a terrible tasting drink teaches me more than the really delicious one for some mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. It's where you grab the wrong ingredient and put it far too much in the cocktail and you realize that is not what you intended. It's gross. You're like, okay. I mean, I come in the vein of where I thoroughly enjoy absinthe, absinthe so I make absinthe frappes. So oh, it is nice. two ounces absinthe, one ounce simple syrup, and top it off with soda water. Mm -hmm. And it's every little delicious absinthe Like an flavor. absinthe cloud hug? Essentially. That's what it is. It's We're best on cracked ice or like, like a... Tiki ice. Yeah, we're going to do some more absinthe this that year. Sounds good. For sure. Okay, just a couple of chats, and then we're going to move on to making a second cocktail. Mm -hmm. uh, we have definitely some absinthe fans in the audience, mm -hmm. which is great. I love absinthe, too. It's also mm -hmm. great if you're not an absinthe fan, because that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, and then the other quick questions are, if you think about Mr. Po Potato Head, this is kind of a question for you. Mm -hmm. If you think about Mr. Potato Heading this cocktail... What would you use maybe instead of the maraschino? Would you do, uh, you know, we can like reference what we did earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could have cited, but we could yeah. do the Quantro as a very obvious choice where that's actually going to be a little bit sweeter than the maraschino, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more kind of orangey flavor. And if you really wanted to accentuate that, you can switch out the bitters as well, change the proportions, mm -hmm. only do orange bitters, then switch out the maraschino with. The Cointreau, and then you have a lot more of a citrus forward cocktail mm -hmm. with all the complexity of the rye and that. Mm -hmm. in that. Even if you want to get weird, you could do it with a sweet Amaro. Uh, mm -hmm. We were referencing um, Nonino or Montenegro. Montenegro. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Montenegro also would work. But then if you wanted to really dig into like the herb herbaceousness of absinthe, you could go another Amaro and do like a Sfumato which is a smoked rhubarb amaro that tastes like dirt in the best possible way. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very intense flavor. Like 
and then mix with the absinthe, you're going to have a very, very bold cocktail. Uh -huh. But that's sometimes, that's someone's jam. So. so for those of you who, and I know you're out there, who have a whole library just of Amari that you've bought to make that one cocktail from Imbibe magazine and then never used again. Um, this go. is another great way that you could potentially begin to swap out and start experimenting is what happens if I add a little, I don't know, Drambuie or Benedictine or any other thing that has the sweetness to it. Cause that's one of the things that the Luxardo brings is it brings that sweetness uh, as well as the cherry. And so you could bring sweet and another flavor together. Um, with another kind of liqueur or amaro or something like that. As I was one referencing cherry herring, that mm -hmm. would like would be a good way. But with that being very sweet, you'd have to kind of cut back some of the portions. So right. again, it's just trial and error. You're at home, drink a few, have a good night. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you love absinthe, I would recommend trying Xander's version of the recipe, which is not a rinse. You just put mm -hmm. a bar spoon in there. And then you the could even start nudging it up. You yeah, say, I want a little bit more than a bar, but you could go to a full, you know, quarter ounce if you wanted to, and it's going to be pretty improved. <laughs> um, How improved? You might you might begin out? to have that absinthe overpower, which is one of the reasons you see absinthe mm -hmm. used in such small quantities. This is just such a potent flavor. Uh, it's a spirit. I mean, it's a totally distilled, really strong spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has a lot of flavor that it brings. Um, but I promise it will not make you hallucinate. <laughs> no, not it. It, it never would. Um, it was just that was part of the absence story is that it was associated yeah. with the opium bars. The, the, the opium Catholic clubs, Church right? partnered with a bunch of people who didn't want to drink and then convinced. It's a big smear campaign. It was. Yeah. The entire smear absent. campaign. The ingredients actually, the active ingredient wormwood is commonly found in baking spices. Mm -hmm. So. Unless you're getting a lot of uh, nutmeg, you're gonna you're gonna be okay. All those yeah. moms breaking the law, <laughs> baking <laughs> too much baking. Before we go on, um, quick question: What was the name of the smoked rhubarb tomorrow? Sfumato. S F M U T O. Am I butchering that? I can't smell spell from smoot smoot. S F S S F M U T O. Sfumato. Yeah, I think that's about right. I'm going to put a question mark. Yes. <laughs> if you, I'm sure if you search what she Smooth. typed out, That's it'll pop up on smuto. Google. That's just smuto. <laughs> Sfumato. Oh, so it's F, S, F. -O. There's something else in there. Look There's other letters. <laughs> All right. Um, second cocktail. If you, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know. Okay, we're going to do the, let's do the fancy free. Okay. I think that maybe those folks that don't like absinthe might just be shy about it. Where? So and we're just going to put it out there. For anyone who's watching, or we'll come to this later. Perfect. We're going to use some uh, Uncle Nearest for this. So this is uh, our... Oh, thank you. No, we won't that too much. 100 proof. Very delicious. Very tasty. Ooh. So the Fancy Free is a really good variation on just basically an old-fashioned, or basically it's the improved whiskey cocktail with different proportions and no absinthe, essentially. So we're going to start off this guy. with just half an ounce of maraschino. So you don't need any sh simple syrup for this. Doing the right line? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just to make our lives easier, important here so you guys can see the kind of all the pores. Half an ounce of that. And then I'm going to be very bold again and do two and a half ounces. Go for it. I think everyone here can handle this. Perfect. Two ounces to the which That's one, one and a half. So it's two oh. ounces to the inside. Perfect. And then you have to I've do totally another halfy. Mm hmm There you go, another half ounce. And then from there, I'm just gonna do two dashes of orange. I'm putting the wrong cap in the wrong thing. It happens all the time. I know. I'm paying too much attention to all these beautiful people. <laughs> And then from there, I'm going to do two dashes of orange bitters and one dash of Angostura bitters. And this time I didn't remember, or didn't not remember. Really you remembered to put the bitters in, yes. It's fantastic. All right, I'm just going to try to miss any of you all. Here comes our favorite part of the episode, you all. In 
those for who wonder whether how long to stir for, the best thing if you're not if you have a chilled yari, it's a little bit harder to do because you just have to count. Generally, ten to twelve seconds is about right. If you don't have a chilled one, just keep your hand on the outside, and as soon as you kind of feel the cold all the way come out, that's a good good point to probably just stop there. And also, still being served on an ice cube, you're going to continue to dilute throughout the enjoyment of the cocktail. Well, that's good. Well, thank you. Ta-da! So it's always good to kind of think about how it's going to be enjoyed and how long it's going to be enjoyed. Sean, when's the last time you had an improved whiskey cocktail? What time is it? <laughs> no, I don't know. It's been a while. I don't know. Maybe months. Or more. <laughs> And then I'm gonna be a big old orange sloth. So the fancy free, I'm gonna drop this one in the chat as well. Is uh, free of absinthe for those of you who are not fans. And as I previously stated, I'm not gonna put this in here because I don't like to mess with trying to eat this orange what peel. Did I just do? So I'll just squirt it over the back. And then rinse it around. It's interesting. And then you can just discard it, or you can put it in some compost. Be green. Or I just hand it to my hair. Friend over here. So, <laughs> delicious, fancy, free. As I said, two and a half rye. Half, all right, we switched it out with rye. We used the delicious Uncle Nearest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Two and a half of that. And then the two dash orange, one dash ango, and an orange twist. Mm -hmm. You can give that one to Sean, unless you're gonna drink. I don't want to steal all that. <laughs> I will, however. Yes. Oh yeah, you straw taste that. Ooh, that is very tasty. So this is gonna be way more on kind of the citrus style when we were referencing earlier with switching out like the maraschino with the Cointreau. This kind of definitely is in that vein. Oh, very so citrus, good. very bold, and being a hundred proof. This is going to be very forward, but the way that we make this, it's not going to be overpowering at all. Very smooth and very delicious. Do you agree, sir? I have to say, I thought I would miss the absinthe more. I feel like the maraschino stands up more than I thought it would because, mm -hmm. well, to me, uh, maraschino, whenever I see it, I think, do half of what it says because I know I can't do the, the full amount. But for some reason, this just really, like, I don't. I don't miss the the bitter sting that absent lovingly bonds on you. Yeah. There we it. go. So we have two cocktails, very similar, but very different flavors based off just a couple subtle changes and whiskey choice. So two beautiful ways to improve your whiskey at home. Um, I'd love to, uh, sorry for the, the little cam switch. Um, mm -hmm. I accidentally discovered a new keyboard shortcut, so now I know what that does. Uh, <laughs> Every day is a school day. Every day is a school day. Uh, so John mentioned that he is using a local Pittsburgh product. I don't know. I want to say Wiggle. Wiggle Deep Cut Rye. But it might be something like Weigel or something, because it's not two Gs. Uh, an over, overproof whiskey with a 95% rye mash bill. Yummy, Ooh. spicy, and bracing. Uh, let us know what whiskeys you have been using this evening. Uh, did you use a second whiskey? Did you? How did you change up your improved whiskey cocktail? Did you make a fancy free, or did you um, try the other version, or did you make any modifications to the first recipe that you made that you like better? Please share that with all the friends here today so that they can also learn from that experience. Yeah. That's another good way of modifying is doing split-based spirits. Mm -hmm. If you like a little bit of flavor from this, but you want the spice of another product, why mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's you can go crazy. Like, People do like what those infinity bottles of their whiskey, and they just oh, they keep they add like a half an ounce of every whiskey bottle they ever buy. And so basically as it goes down, you just keep adding it and it becomes an infinity bottle where it takes on its own flavor because you're always adding new product. That is so fun. I've never heard of that concept. That's kind of like, that's kind of like, um, well, I probably shouldn't say this out loud because now no one will go to pho restaurants, but the pho restaurants, one of the secrets they have is they don't wash the pot. Oh, so they just keep like, they'll, they'll boil another thing of stock and like the pot, it's come on, it's getting boiled, but like there's a residue in there that's almost like proprietary for the, the broth of that spot. Like the pot is part of the broth and like this, 
it like it was the same thing with like yeah. a mother sourdough for sourdough yeah right? you have the same sourdough. mother as originally could be mm-hmm. over a hundred years old mm-hmm. or we talk about the sherry technique for when you like on the turn where you go from multiple barrels down to second two barrels down to one barrels there's always going to be a little bit of the original product no matter what how many times you add to it great so let's talk about uncle nearest we great. have um just so you know, we've got people using Angel's Envy, Whistle Pig Piggyback. Um, I'm not sure anybody else has been bold enough to. Oh, we got a monkey, monkey 47 up here. Monkey shoulder. Oh, monkey, monkey shoulder. Mon- and... Monkey shoulder. Sorry, I'm trying to go up and see piggyback in Rittenhouse. Yeah. You like piggyback? The bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, piggyback's mm-hmm. a good one. It's a, it's a quality um, one to be in a cocktail. Yeah. So uh, Uncle Nearest is. We had a question specifically. Is it a rye? It is not a rye. It's not a rye. So these are kind of our two main products. We have the 1884, which is a seven-year small batch. They have the same mash bill. It's 84% corn, 8% rye, 8% barley. But the cool thing is what I always kind of introduce people, which is why I didn't use this one, because this is what most people expect me to use, is this actually does come off as a rye to begin with. It's a little Mm. bit spicy to begin with, but super bright and then kind of very, very smooth at the end. What separates Tennessee whiskey from other bourbons is we do a process called the Lincoln County process, where we mellow it through sugar maple charcoal, where basically the giant <laughs> vat great. is like 13 feet tall, and it's all sugar maple charcoal, and we add the unaged whiskey on top, and it takes almost a week to go through. And what's a kind of a common mistake is people assume maple, they assume maple flavoring. This technique actually only strips flavors. Mm. Basically, during the distillation process you're going to get volatile compounds that either a make your whiskey taste not well or good or b give you hangovers so that actually strips out all those cogeners is what the technical name for them is cogeners Cogeners. very smooth so that's why begins very spicy but ends very smooth and then the 1856 is a blend of uh nine to 14 year old whiskey 100 proof and I usually, I always say this is my line, is that I will bet money that it's probably the hundred, the easiest drinking 100 proof product you've ever had in your life. Mm. Well, I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I made that. I don't know from experience or anything. You, you don't often go out and sip on 100 proof products all the time? What I, I mean, do. you have some delicious some cool wild turkey yeah. 101. Well, Todd just said right here, he, he's like, I'm finishing up the Uncle Nearest we purchased a bit ago. It is tasty straight up. It is. Hell yeah. It is. That's great. Which one did he have? Uh, which one did you have, Todd Bot? Let us know. <laughs> um, do we want to go into a little bit of the story of the product? Or yes, ah, yes I, I really want you to tell the story of the product. Awesome. I'll try to not go too in depth because I can talk about this for hours. But quickly is that um, Uncle Nearest was actually the first African American master distiller on record. And as a young boy, Jack Daniel came to work on the farm he was enslaved at, and he was introduced and then was taught by Nearest Green how to make whiskey. So this kind of rewrites a lot of the history that a lot of people believed. And the even more cool thing is that once Jack was able to grow up, actually not much because he actually came out of the farm around four and at 13, he had the opportunity to buy the distillery off the man he worked for. Hmm. And actually the man was really nice because he was a pastor and actually gave him like basically didn't have to buy it outright. He could buy it off over time. So Jack took over and with the knowledge that Nearest Green bestowed to him, and then hired on Nearest Green as his first master distiller. What's very unique about this time is also that Jack actually paid his black and white employees equal based off their experience. From that point on, there's actually been seven continuous generations of Greens working for uh, Jack Daniels until modern day. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. So it's the original whiskey distiller that no one ever knew who actually brought the technique of sugar maple charcoal filtering from West Africa, where they used to use it to filter water to purify it. So I'm assuming he came over here, tasted our whiskey, and said, I know how to make that better. Mm-hmm. Filter it through a little mm. charcoal. Well, uh, so say, Jack it, Daniels. It is very easy drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's for sure. So Jack Daniels learned everything that he knew about distilling from Uncle Nearest. Correct. That's why and it's but, called Uncle, right? Yeah. Well, Uncle is a term like, of endearment from mm-hmm, in the South. Mm-hmm. And his name being Nearest Green. Mm-hmm. So. Just Uncle Nearest. It's our friendly neighbor, friendly neighborhood whiskey guy. Right. And it's just won a ton of awards recently, too. Yeah. So. I'll go over a few of them. Um, kind of a little explanation of why it didn't show up until kind of recently is because the story didn't make it out of Lynchburg, Tennessee, until my boss, Fawn Weaver, 
discovered an article written about it being like, hey, I heard through the grapevine, like this is the story, but not a lot of people had facts behind it. Her being a very, very motivated individual convinced her husband to move down to Lynchburg, Tennessee and started interviewing with the oldest living descendants of Nearest Green and Jack Daniel and found out that this whole story is 100% true. They were friends, they worked together and Jack did everything in his ability to let everyone know about Nearest Green. Even in the 1960s, there's a biography written about Jack where Nearest is mentioned more than his own family. Hmm. So going back to my boss, moves down to Tennessee, proves the whole story to be true and launches near Green. As of right now, we are the fastest growing independent whiskey company ever. We're the most award-winning American whiskey or bourbon of 2019 and 2020. We are the most award-winning African-American owned and founded spirits brand of all time. Fawn Weaver is the first woman and the first African-American to be the lead of a major spirits brand. We're the only whiskey company, I think, right now that has an all-woman lead team. And then our 1884 is blended by Victoria Edie Butler, who is Nearest Green's great-great-granddaughter. And she's the first and only female African-American master blender in the country that just won Best Master Blender of 2020. Yeah. Wow. So a few of the awards. I want to clap. So, if you haven't had Spirit Hands, Spirit Hands. Yeah. Uncle Nearest, we definitely recommend um, to go and explore the spirit mm-hmm. because it is it is also just, besides the amazing story, just a beautiful whiskey to have in your bar. Thank you. Um, so, anyone as else? As he drinks the house. <laughs> as he drinks the house. I'm sorry. I know. I love um, my Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse is great. Um, I swear my home, my home bar is not only Uncle Nearest. I have probably... <laughs> 200 other different bottles no. of whiskey, gin, rye, spirits. Like, whiskey I'm a lover lovers of all my children. Love whiskey. Um, so, real whiskey lovers say, my favorite whiskey is the whiskey someone bought for me. Yeah. Or it's the glass well, in front of me. That's or the glass it. in front of yeah. me. Because, yeah, yeah it's, 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 somebody could buy you a whiskey and you could be like, mm. <laughs> it depends. The only thing that can ruin good whiskey is company. Oh. Not, not any company, oh. like the bad wrong, company. The wrong company. You know, so the only like, thing that can ruin good like, whiskey is bad company. Yeah. So there you go. Mm-hmm. And luckily, and I have good, very company good company can improve bad whiskey too. Correct. This is true. Right. With good company, you don't really care what quality the whiskey is, truly. Truly. With You're good like, company comes great responsibility. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so our channel is changing. <laughs> We're going down okay. a rabbit hole. This is what happens. Um, so would love to hear also, what do you guys think? I saw a couple of comments in there that uh, it seemed like some of you had tried the Improved Whiskey Cocktail for the first time. And you said it was amazing. So would love it to know, would love to know if it's going to make it into your, um, into your regular bar rotation. And um, any of you who have made Improved Whiskey Cocktails for a while and you have a like great little tip or a recipe that you like or you figured out and dialed in the way that you love it um we would love for you to share that with us too i have to say um today has specifically taken my excitement for this drink and like taken it up a notch like like i was saying before the old-fashioned and like the genesis of that and then how it evolved through time and then became other kinds of cocktails um brings us to the improved whiskey cocktail but today like I'm excited about variations on this drink that I was like, you know, a gateway for us into the culture, but then continues to keep me like excited about where cocktails are going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why I'm very excited for like the general knowledge of people who are also consuming nowadays. Coming from a few years ago when I was bartending, people would start to try to like, not necessarily trick me, but they'd like challenge my knowledge. And it's cool to see people pursuing more information about what they're drinking more information about what they like so they're starting to figure out the history of different products and the history of certain spirits and going in and educating themselves to kind of further bring back products like going back to absinthe it was illegal from 1912 until 2006 and 2007 in america and a lot of that was people starting to kind of like ask about these things and push back and bring back why was this illegal so there's certain products that are coming back alive that kind of could have gone disappeared for a long time. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, rip Ameripacon. It is sad, but also we get gifts like this that like, you know, no one really saw this coming. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, in the spirits industry, like this story 
it has a lot of history. Yeah, it was a hundred. We always say it's 160 years in the making, and it and wasn't it, until the right person. And no one really, no one really knew about it until like what, ten years ago? Less. We Less? released in 2017. Oh, you guys, it honestly mm -hmm. is that good. Like I'm serious. Oh, like yeah. I don't pimp stuff out hardcore, but like, that's <laughs> it's. Amazing. Sean was so excited when we we're like, Xander's coming for the live stream. Yeah. Like, oh, good. He'll bring Uncle Nearest. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I I had definitely tried it before, and um. It's it, it just is that good. It's like sometimes you get a really good story, but then you try the product and you're like, okay, that's good marketing, but it's not. It, it's definitely it, it's the real McCoy and a really good story. Mm -hmm. We have the double hit. Yep. Yeah. One of the things I like about the improved whiskey cocktail, or one of the things that it signifies for me too, is um, just the the idea that we all have this journey of cocktails and you all have maybe your origin cocktail or the cocktail that made the light bulb go off, you know, somewhere behind your head that said, wow, cocktails are really amazing. And so one of the things I think would be fun is for you just to think about what was that cocktail for you and how would you revisit that cocktail now? Maybe it's only weeks later, maybe it's months or years later. Uh, for us, it was, I don't know, that like nine years ago? It was a while ago. It was almost a decade ago. More. And so when I think about revisiting it, you can revisit it with like a different spirit and maybe try it. Sometimes when you discover a new spirit, like I remember the time when we discovered Martin Miller's gin. Ooh. And we're just like, wow, this is an amazing gin. And that new discovery of that new gin made us want to revisit all the simple gin cocktails using that gin to explore what was that cocktail like with this new gin that we've discovered. And so I think that's one of the cool things about this journey is you can go back and revisit um, and just kind of swap things out or you've discovered a new a new bourbon or a new rye. It's like, what are some of those classic cocktails that you really like that you said, I'm going to go back and make that Sazerac with this now. Um, that happened for me with the uh, Caipirinha. Oh, yeah? Ooh. Yeah. The, well, the first time I'd ever had Cachaca mm -hmm. was, was we got LeBlanc. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I just had never had one before. I had never ordered one in a bar. It was never on a menu. I never made one. And then we did. And I was, it was like, really good. Okay. You know, like the sour family keeps getting more and more um, robust and dynamic because you literally discover a new, however long ago it was, but it was new to me then. Like yeah. that new spirit that, like, it tastes different than just rum. It has you so know, much more it's, body, too. Yeah, it's and a like, really different experience. It's still the same sour, basically, right? Depending on whether you you know muddle it and keep it in the drink or you shake it beforehand. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. it. But it, it, some people aren't familiar with the Caprinha. Uh, the traditional technique is you take an entire half of the lime, peel and juice to muddle it. So you don't get just a traditional citrus flavor. You also so add, so you add sugar on it as well and muddle all together. Yeah, yeah. You get the pith. You get the oils from the skin. It has a lot more depth of flavor, let alone the cachaca that goes in it that also has way more flavor than traditional white rum that people are used to. Like, people get Bacardi, that's not going to taste like much. Mm -hmm. Cachaca is just a whole, whole other... It's another beast. Yeah. It like is. the rum apricot we were talking about last week. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just a totally different version of that. Um, I think Uncle Nearest is available nationwide, right? Correct. Nationwide. Oh, find it. it may not be at Even your... Even if you're in a... Um, we're in a lot of... Um, we're in some Costco's, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. Um, what's the chain out here? BevMo? BevMo. BevMo. Um, but we have, an ambassador, we have about 48 ambassadors countrywide all working their asses off to be able to get this brand out to everyone. So reach out to... Kind you of, can reach you, out to us? I mean, you can reach out to me. Um, or yeah, just look up... Xander makes drinks on Instagram. Yep. Xander with an X. And ask where it is, and I can reach out to any coworkers and give you yep. a couple places because we want everyone to get it in their hands and enjoy it. If you go to, um, if you haven't looked already either, or if you're not on our m email, if you're not a member of the cocktail journey, this is a good um, way to get part of it. This is, yeah, this is a great way. Yep, uh, but we sent out a, a quick announcement yesterday that we've updated a few things on our website. So you can go and look at upcoming live streams. We can see a live stream calendar. Look at what's coming up for the next four weeks. And you can see all of our guest profiles. Your Instagram is linked there as oh, well. Oh, fancy. Mm -hmm. You can go find me there. So you can go find Xander at thecocktailjourney.com. 
Click on live events and then scroll down to see all the guests there. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, Jamie was asking if there's a single origin story for the cocktail. And John Schmid said it's kind of one of those prehistoric cocktails. Are I like that word. Improved, uh, talking about the improved cocktail. Yeah, the improved cocktail. There's yeah. not like a single. It was a, just a general movement. And mm -hmm. people just not wanting the change. Should we talk about There was like, probably some person in some bar one time who's I mean, like, I just am tired of regular whiskey. Can you put some other stuff in it? Should we talk about what the improved cocktail is? I don't know who that is. Detailed or entailed? We did a little bit. Yeah, I mean, right? mostly, yeah, anything, mo any basically any modifier to jazz yeah. up a traditional basic cocktail mm -hmm. that was What was it typically, maraschino? Traditionally, yeah. And like, absinthe? Maraschino and absinthe are like the pair that you'll see a lot. But... Occasionally, occasionally dry curacao, mm -hmm. but not as common, obviously. It's any, basically any modifier that was available around then that mm -hmm. had kind of a little sweetness and herbaceousness. But the modern years. version of improved cocktails, you know, I think uh, John Park said it earlier, uh, he, lo he loves adding Namaro to his whiskey to improve it. And so really it's anything that you want to add to yeah. an old fashioned cocktail or a simple cocktail to make it better. I mean, isn't that what modern cocktails are? Yeah. They're all improved versions yeah, you just in keep some like way, shape Man, or form. Black Manhattan is just, to, instead of the vermouth, you have Ap yeah. or Amaro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's the technical way, if you could say the improved whiskey cocktail is whiskey plus, you know. Modifier. Um, this and this. So some people say it's always these two together. Um, but in general, it's the process of improving a drink yeah. or a cocktail. You can improve it with whatever it makes your heart content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dare I mention Pisco? We mm -hmm. are going to talk about Pisco and cachaca and all the different kinds of rum and brandy distillates and all the things from there i might just have to come by later on that side yeah we're gonna make punch uh, so if you if you're just joining yeah. us if this is not if this is like one of your first live streams um i'm rachel eva this is sean michael we and this is xander obviously one of our guests <laughs> uh, we started a barware company like i don't know almost a decade ago i feel like i can say that it's probably only been like seven years. Uh, 2013 was our first. Okay. almost. I'll say almost a decade ago. It was like eight years ago. Um, we make barware. It is pretty handy. We're not here to peddle or pitch the barware. We're here because um, through our journey, which started with making barware, we have just have fallen in love more and more with cocktail craft. And we come from this experience of being home bartenders that have been able to access this world of knowledge and depth of history and flavors and and so we started this thing called the cocktail journey we've been meeting every week since the end of january to do these live streams but we do have a lot more coming um this year we're focusing on 52 classic cocktails and modern favorites that you can make with just 15 bottles in your bar but obviously we want to get into things like you know rum agricole and cachaca and pisco and all these other beautiful explorations and that is part of the plan for our journey is to start with this foundational area and then begin to expand from there because let's be honest when you get to a certain place 15 bottles is just not quite enough i think some of you said you have 200 um, i know someone who has 1800 bottles in their bar and they still are interested in engaging in the dialogue about this journey of cocktails and how to navigate I mean, if I had 1,800 bottles, I would definitely need a road How do you keep so. them clean? How do you keep <laughs> Who do you hire? Randy? Somebody that's just, their, their whole job is just dusting, dusting bottles. That's it. I'm um, a very nice cleaner who cleans all my bottles. <laughs> so we just wanted to invite you along. Um, we are going to have some exciting announcements over the next few nice. weeks. Uh, so if you're not making it to every live stream, and we're also not going to, I mean, the live streams here are for talking and diving deep into these cocktails. So if you want to hear about the other things that we have and have planned and are going on with, just go to thecocktailjourney.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you can drop your email in there, and you'll start getting the weekly emails that announce what cocktail's coming up, as well as any updates about other things that we're doing in terms of education. Um, we will eventually do like a deep dive into bitters and cocktail summits and workshops and all the things that we want to really get into the weeds about. Uh, so drop your email there if you're not a member and you'll get notified when we start doing those.
Uh, okay, where do you put them all? Diane, the, I, the guy who's got a lot of bottles, I think he's got a cellar or something. I mean, you'd have to, right? Industrial you'd have to shelves. Have a whole room. We've thought about it. We have, I mean, we don't have that many. I, I, we just don't keep them in the bar long enough. But uh, quite a few of you have uh, quite a few bottles. At some point, I think we're going to do like a bar share where you all can share photos of your bar. photos of your bar. No. Some of you have sent me bought, like photos of your bars that you're building out, and they're quite impressive. And I get a little jealous, especially of those of you that have like the glass freezers. You know, Ooh, you know what we might do? I have a question. <laughs> this is for our viewers and our our, our homies. Uh -huh. Would you guys want to do a ver um, an episode of, of a live stream where we put the camera on the other side of the bar, and you know, we kind of put our butt to the bar, where you can see what's going on behind the bar? Would you want that? You let us know. You can have like the picture in picture at some point. That's true. Or just hang one from the ceiling and have it straight yeah. down. Yeah, see what all our hands too. are doing. We're doing it all next week. We're hiding lots of things back here. So that's the other thing is um, if you have something to say or you want to give us feedback about the live streams or things you want to see, just send us an email. Yeah. It's real easy. Um, we're info at the cocktailjourney.com for now. And you can also just. Uh, oh, John Sch Schmidt wants bar porn. Yes, sharing all the bar stuff is right. great. Um, so we're always very open to suggestions. Uh, we've got so much stuff great going in the chatter. Thanks for the, uh, one of you recommended we we get a Discord channel up, and <clears throat> we've already Eventually. talked to John about that at some point in the past, and we'll do again in the future. Um, yes to the different camera angles and shows, and yeah, we're just super excited. We love having y'all here this this week. Did you almost say y'all? I did say y'all. It was almost a y'all. No, I have started saying y'all, actually. We are technically in the South. Oh, yeah, because Uncle Nears. It's just, it's, it's easy. It, it's okay when we have Uncle Nears here. Yeah. yeah. You can say y'all now. I, I can say y'all whenever I want. <laughs> Made in Tennessee, where all the good people are down South. <laughs> where all the good people are. Uh, what are we doing next week? Next week we're doing the gin and tonic. Okay, Ooh. you guys, I'm so excited about the gin and tonic. <laughs> you want to cure malaria, you have to come next week. Okay, so I think I think that some of some part of me thinks, are people really going to be interested in the gin and tonic? It's such a simple drink. I love the gin and tonic. My kryptonite is quinine because it's just like it's it's such it is such a simple drink, but there's so much that you can do with it. And we're doing gin and tonic the day before National Gin and Tonic Day. Ooh, pretty smart. Okay. Apropos. We're pretty smart. So gin and tonic is a favorite here at our bar, it's and there's smart. some beautiful things that you can do with gin and tonic. Uh, so we're make sure you got your gin. Have a couple different gins if you want. I mean, you know, you, those of you that have like a giant bar, this is a great opportunity to play with different gins. So make sure you stop up, stock up on your gin, and then we're gonna make it with both tonic water as well as a tonic syrup. Uh, so. If you wanted to, you can get that from Small Hand. We recommend Small Hand Foods, uh, the tonic syrup, which is really nice because then you can adjust the level of like sweetness and quinine in your gin and tonic. Um, suggestion for a fun tonic. We recommend any tonic that doesn't have high fructose corn syrup in it. So don't yes. go buy your, you know, the bottom shelf ones. Um, I don't know if we have any here. While she's looking, I definitely, I would more recommend Finding an actual syrup and adding your soda water, just straight up soda water instead of, you know. This is the tonic yeah. syrup that we use. I don't, it's not going to focus in on it, but it looks like this. It's small hand foods. Um, but I think we use Q tonic. There's, Q -tonic's what are the other good tonics? Polar. Polar tonic. Mm -hmm. There's some great uh, tonics out there. Um, and it's a great excuse to try a new gin, Diane. It is going to be a long weekend next week, Matt. Um, so join us for gin and tonic. You don't need a lot. You need gin and you need tonic water. Maybe some lime. Get some and lime. Ice. And some and ice. And you a know? glass. And if a you glass. If you try to make it in your lap, don't send photos. Yeah. You can't accept that. Yeah. You can make it in a tub if you have a lot of it. That's fine. Fever Tree Tonic is also very nice. Yeah, we recommend them. So, um, yeah, play around with a couple different tonics. If you get the, the tonic syrup, then you just also want to make sure that you have seltzer or, or soda water. Or something to make it bubbly, because this isn't bubbly. Um, so, any last words? No. I just want to say thank you for having me, and make some delicious cocktails, and share the story with you guys. Thank you for telling us the story of Uncle Nearest yeah. so clearly, and for your you know great input. It was so fun. 
Thank you so much. Cheers, you guys. I actually meant... Make some variations. This is great. I actually meant, do you want to make a last word? Ooh. Can we just make everything with chartreuse? (laughs) That's my other one love passion. (laughs) Green chartreuse in everything. We, chartreuse we is not, chartreuse it, I know, it's not part of the 15 bottle bar. Yeah, We're going to get there. You got to live a little. We're going to get there. I'll come back once I get my chartreuse that. tattoo. Sorry, it's going to go from here to here. <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll see you next week for the gin and tonic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, improve your whiskey, improve your gin, and have fun playing around. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Cheers. We'll see you. Well. That was fun.